that's my mom and dad, Ernie and Maggie Thompson. And they were an interracial couple that started dating in the 1940s, a little before Bill de Blasio and his wife. Um, <laughs> they dated in Harlem, which was a friendly place where you could be an interracial couple. This is a photograph of Harlem. I actually grew up in the African-American community in Orange, New Jersey, um, which was, you know, much smaller. But what we had in common was the people in the windows. When I was a teenager, I used to think I was sneaking boys into my house after school, which I was definitely not supposed to do. But my Aunt Betty was always looking out the window, and she would call my parents, and I got in so much trouble. It was this watching and this organization and this system that helped us to grow up to be good people. I became a doctor. James Baldwin from Harlem became a great writer. In 1988, I was doing public health research in San Francisco, and the papers reported that there was an outbreak of gonorrhea among African-American teenagers, and it noted that this was linked to smoking crack cocaine. I, I didn't know anything about crack cocaine, so I sat down with some people who'd used the drug, and I you know, said, so how do you take it, like every four hours? And they said, um, they said, no, if you have $150, you go to the crack house and you take $150. If you have $30,000 and a Mercedes, you go to the crack house and you take $30,000 and you give them the keys. And they said, and we buy it from teenagers. And I sat down with some teenagers, some, some, young, some young guys, and I said, yeah, so what's up? And they were like, that's our job, man, that's our job. And if crack goes away, it's going to be another drug. I'm going to sell that. And yeah, I'm going to sell it to pregnant women because they're going to buy it from somebody else if I don't sell it to them. 1990, I moved back to the East Coast, and this is what Harlem looked like. One in three buildings had been destroyed. And I heard the same stories of crack and AIDS and desperation for jobs. As a physician, this problem of how is this to be healed, how is it to be controlled, just completely took over my whole body. I went to Paris, and I went to a conference on AIDS, substance abuse, and homelessness. This tall French guy with his big gray hair walked to the podium, and he said, if you want to heal the problems of the neighborhoods, you have to fix the city. His name was Michel Cantal Dupar and I asked him to be my teacher, and he has been my teacher ever since, and I've studied with him in France and in the United States. And it's his principles of urban alchemy that I've tried to apply, and one of them was that the fracture in the city is between the rich neighborhoods and the poor neighborhoods, and of course in the United States between white and black, and that what we had to do was find ways to make connection. In my own neighborhood where I work is Washington Heights, and. The first map with the colors is the 1937 redlining map. And this map was created by race and class. The second map is an aerial photograph that hung on our office wall, which to me was a challenging new way of looking at the area, because to the top of the arrow is Washington Heights, to the bottom of the arrow is Harlem. In my head, these two places were separate. They didn't connect, but on the map, they obviously connected. And one of the places where they connected was where Highbridge Park met Jackie Robinson Park. And this took us exploring in the parks. Highbridge Park at that time was really abandoned, and we found the most amazing things in there. Everybody has seen the tall water tower, but there are huge bridges with stone arches, secret graffiti made by the homeless people who live there. It was an amazing thing. Urbanist Marshall Brown said we could make a trail that would connect parks between Central Park and all the way up north through these escarpment parks that hug the hillside. He said our name should be City Life is Moving Bodies, Climb, and he made us a logo. Every year we have a community potluck party, and neighbors, all the organizations in northern Manhattan, bring tables and chairs and food and entertainment. Um, we hike to the site and we have a lot of fun, and we always have paper mache giraffes. <laughs> because if you need to bring a New York City abandoned forest back to life, your most powerful weapon is false eyelashes. <laughs> it works. Okay. 
we are making a new map. And we're doing this with the help of designers that connect it with us through Design NYC. Um, at Hike the Heights 9, we collected information. This is our new map. This will be our 10th year, and you're all invited. I brought you buttons. <laughs> but the problem that we face is that in this time, we have watched Harlem gentrify, and we know that if we don't stop the policies, the neighborhoods of New York will continue to be torn apart. When I talk to people about the problems of poor neighborhoods, they say to me, well, I feel bad for them. That's like me saying, I'm paralyzed, I feel bad for my legs. Our nation is paralyzed, but it's not, the poor neighborhoods are not a separate part, we are one nation. Michelle Cantal Dupart told us we could heal by connection. And he is right, we can heal by connection. And so I bring you this message from our hood. Rock the love. Thank you.